This is Kent Blackhurst, and this is the third segment on Fasten Your Seatbelts for the Second Coming. When is a sign a sign? In the modern world, many believe that signs from God are mere superstitions. Yet, are they? Over the next few minutes, we'll go over the Hebrew and Greek definitions to gain a greater understanding of how God works through heavenly signs. I'm excited to show how signs are given to communicate God's warnings to the world and how and why they're given around holy days. We will talk about how they fulfill prophecy to strengthen believers and why they seem to be discounted and unnoticed among non-believers. So first, to show how they were set up from the beginning, let's read Genesis 1.14. And God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night. And let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. So from the beginning, we see that there was a purpose for the lights in the firmament besides just lighting up the night sky. They were for signs and for seasons. Now, in English, we might just gloss over that phrase and say, Okay, signs. A sign is a marker or signal from heaven that something is about to occur. If you click on the footnote for signs in the Gospel Library, you'll see that it directs you to the topical guide for signs in symbolism. Through this study, you'll see that the purpose of signs are often used for warning. In fact, in Greek, the word used for signs had a connotation of warning signs. In Hebrew, the word that they used means constellations, and that's the synonym for signs. So, if we merge these two definitions together, we can extrapolate that whenever God had a warning, he'd use the constellations to warn the earth of impending happenings or judgments. Ancient cultures understood this. Thus, they spent a whole lot more time gazing at the stars than we do. To illustrate how translations can be off, in the late 1970s, the U.S. military was trying to come up with one of the first translating software programs. They translated the phrase, The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak, into Russian. Then, without the aid of the Bible, they took the Russian translation from English and again tried to translate it back into the original to see how accurate it was. The result? The phantom really wants it, but the meat is tired. Hmm. It seems the meaning may have been a little lost in the translation. The original translation for the English word seasons in the Greek Bible was taken from the word moedim, which also has a connotation for times of holy feast days. Did I mention that all holy days for Jews always have a prescribed feast? I like that tradition. Before I learned this, season just represented winter, spring, summer, and fall. Hey, if I step outside in the winter, I don't have to look up in the sky to tell me it's cold. With this new understanding that season represents holy days as to the timing that warning signs and annunciations are given, it offers deeper understanding. Now for the question, why is it important to look at the signs in the heavens and in the earth beneath? Well, it's because for millennia, prophets along with the Savior have testified that there would be many signs preceding the second coming. The whole point of this presentation is to reinforce that we are now living in that day long ago prophesied. There have always been signs and wonders in the heaven that remind the world of what God has promised. The new star in the heavens that announced Christ's birth, for example, the alignment of the planets create a new star about every 20 to 22 years or so. Yet at times, it's brighter due to the proximity of the planet to the Earth at the time. So the fact that in 6 BC, that it appeared at Passover around the meridian of time when he was expected to be born, is why the wise men from the East were looking in the skies. They had already known that the hour was close. Likewise, just as eclipses happen all the time, meaning that there could be between one and three total lunar eclipses every year, and anywhere between one and five solar eclipses along with several meteor showers annually as well, we should look at them for their metaphorical symbolism. And for something to be a sign from God, you need to look at other criteria as well. For example, first is mentioned if it falls on a holy day. 
that's something to consider. Second, the timing of these events with respect to other signs being given should be taken into account. For example, in the ancient world, the Jews understood that the Messiah would reign King of Kings, so they knew he'd come in a time of political oppression. They were subject to the Romans when Christ was born. Granted, it hadn't been revealed to them yet at that time, for him to be crowned king wouldn't come until the seventh millennium. But they at least knew that his coming would come at a time when they were in political distress. The third way to know when it comes from God is related. A sign would come during the season dictated from God through revelation. For example, the meridian of time for Christ's birth and after the opening of the seventh seal for his second coming. Fourth, we also know it comes from God if there are things that seem too orchestrated to be a mere coincidence. You'll see what I mean as I continue. So, does God continue to use signs and wonders in the heavens to warn us or to manifest near future events? Well, he should if he's the same today as yesterday and forever. These phenomena and marvels in the heavens have reminded the world of what God has promised and shows that his mercy is manifest. In the Doctrine and Covenants, section 45, 39 through 41, it says, And it shall come to pass that he that feareth me shall be looking for the great day of the Lord to come, even the signs of the coming of the Son of Man. And they shall see signs and wonders, and they shall be shown forth in the heavens above and in the earth beneath. And they shall behold blood and fire and vapors of smoke. Remember, blood and fire and vapors of smoke were the words Joel used as well, which predicted events of the sixth seal. But these are again repeated by John in the events of the seventh seal as well. So again, this exemplifies how signs repeat themselves and become types of things to come. As all will be established by two or three witnesses, there were three signs given back in 2017, and again three more signs given in 2020 for a total of two sets of three distinct signs in heaven. As believers, we shouldn't dismiss them as mere coincidence or that we're just reading into them what we want. Now, what were these? In August of 2017, there was an eclipse that crossed over the U.S. Then in September of the same year, there was the sign of the woman as described in Revelation 8, 1 and 2. Then on October 10th, the drachnoid meteor shower appeared as described in Revelation 8, 3. Then again, three years later, on June 21st, there was an annular solar eclipse over the skies of Jerusalem, representing the sign prophesied in Revelation 8.12. Later, on December 14, 2020, there was a solar eclipse over South America. And then, on December 21st, 2020, there appeared the Christmas star, or the sign of the Son of Man. These all have different meanings, but they are all signs indicating the days in which we live. Throughout the book of Revelation, the darkening of the sun is frequently used as a metaphor. So what is its significance? Gary L. Stevenson of the Quorum of the Seventies shed some light on the subject. A total he solar said, eclipse occurs when the moon moves between the earth and the sun, almost completely blocking any light from the sun. If you imagine the sun as the size of a common bicycle tire, the moon in comparison would be scarcely the size of a small pebble. How is it possible that the very source of our warmth, light, and life could be so greatly obstructed by something comparatively insignificant in size? Although the sun is 400 times larger than the moon, it is also 400 times farther away from the earth. From earth's perspective, this geometry makes the sun and moon appear to be the same size. When the two are aligned just right, the moon seems to obscure the entire sun. In the same manner that the very small moon can block the magnificent sun, extinguishing its light and warmth, a spiritual eclipse can occur when we allow minor and troublesome obstructions. A solar eclipse is indeed a remarkable phenomenon of nature, during which the beauty, warmth, and light of the sun can be completely covered by a comparatively insignificant object causing darkness and chill. A similar phenomenon can be replicated in a spiritual sense 
when otherwise small and insignificant matters are drawn too close and block the beauty, warmth, and heavenly light of the gospel of Jesus Christ, replacing it with cold darkness. Gospel glasses comprised of a knowledge and testimony of gospel principles and ordinances provide spiritual protection and clarity for someone exposed to the hazards of a spiritual eclipse. In short, don't let life's distractions eclipse heaven's light. I bear testimony that no matter the obstruction that may block our vision of gospel light, the light is still there. That source of warmth, truth, and brightness is the gospel of Jesus Christ. There are many last day prophecies speaking of the sun being darkened and the moon turning to blood, as I mentioned. The main phenomena that explains this are solar and lunar eclipses. Remember, in the first century when John wrote, and in Old Testament times when Joel wrote, there was no scientific word for an eclipse, lunar or otherwise. They would have expressed this phenomenon simply as the sun being darkened and the moon turning to blood. There was also no mention as to how long this would last, but simply that it would occur. Any thought as to the duration is only done by our own mind filling in the blanks. And as mentioned in my last video, eclipses happened everywhere on the earth at least once or twice during a thousand year period during the sixth seal. Again, it's being repeated in the seventh seal various times as well. For example, it happens around the time that there will be voices of thunderings and lightnings. John said this would happen near the end of the half hour of silence. The Doctrine and Covenants, section 88, 87, and 90, puts these things pretty close together. And in section 35, verse 9, it is what precedes the great destructions that await the wicked. So it shouldn't surprise us that the solar eclipse that traversed in the land of New Jerusalem, also known as the Americas, in 2017, fulfilled John's prophecy signifying that we are living in that appointed time to mark that generation living before Christ's second coming. What evidence do we have that the eclipse occurring on August 21st, 2017 was a sign from Heavenly Father? First, this sign followed the instruction of a sign as outlined in Genesis, right in the middle of a holy day. Rosh Chodash depicts the two days in each Hebrew calendar month giving birth to a new moon. Among the Jews, the new moon is considered a sacred time, and a prescribed feast is had in celebration. When a constellation sign is shown around a holy day, then that is the signal of being a heavenly sign from God. In this case, the sun became darkened across North America in fulfillment of prophecy. How else did this eclipse fit the criteria as a warning sign, besides also coinciding with a holy day? Well, what really interested me was that this eclipse darkened seven different cities called Salem in its course. These cities got their name from Jerusalem. In Hebrew, Salem for Shalom means peace. So if the sun darkened seven municipalities called peace, it isn't difficult to see that the symbolism would mean that peace will be taken from the earth. Remember, seven represents completeness or being full or finished. It also has a connotation of perfection, in this case of perfect execution in its totality. Now, I know that there are 26 municipalities called Salem scattered over 26 states in the U.S., so of course it would be likely that an eclipse would darken a few of them. However, it darkened exactly seven, and this carries biblical symbolism. It will create an X over the U.S. This X is reminiscent of the Aramaic in Hebrew shape called a tog, which is used to glorify and decorate some of the Hebrew letters and scrolls of Holy Writ, including but not limited to the Torah. An X also characterizes a cross, reminding Christians of Christ's crucifixion and atonement. It also denotes a crossroad, which symbolizes the intersecting points between good and evil, or the living and the dead. The tog, the cross, and crossroads all connote protection against danger. Thus, 
This X drawn near the center of the U.S. can emphasize a place of protection against evil forces until God's judgments towards the wicked have been completed before the second coming. For me, it's a witness to believers of God's hand in what is now taking place. Now, the irony doesn't escape me that both eclipses cross over and intersect in Missouri, where there is the city of New Jerusalem, and also where an extermination order against members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints back in 1838 was given, allowing Missourians permission to do whatever might be necessary to exterminate or drive away every last Latter-day Saint out of the state. In the case of Hans Mill, this included massacring its inhabitants. The second eclipse will also darken Illinois, where the saints were forced out at gunpoint to leave the state, and it also passes over Kirtland, Ohio, and Palmyra, New York, where early saints of this dispensation were persecuted to the extent that they had to leave there as well. And so ask yourself, if these signs make an appropriate warning of God's impending judgments. Perhaps the second eclipse is a sign that the time of the Gentiles is about to end. I believe that the 2017 eclipse was the warning that the years of tribulation would begin shortly. Looking back, it certainly seems that it was fulfilled. Perhaps the 2024 eclipse is another marker of another wave of judgments that will occur before the second coming, or the foreshadowing of the mission of the two witnesses beginning their ministry in Jerusalem. Both eclipses are warning benchmarks somehow associated with the darkening state of the world. Some might ask, well, why hasn't the sign been given over Jerusalem? I would say that it's because the U.S. is part of the New Jerusalem, and here resides a greater portion of the house of Israel. After all, the time of the Gentiles has not ended yet. And because of that, it's fitting that the sign be given in New Jerusalem. The eclipse in 2024 is likely the sign that the time of the Gentiles is about to end. And it is entirely possible that this warning sign indicates for us to beware as the Lord's arm is ready to be revealed again. Let's look at another recent sign in the heavens. Now, on September 23rd of 2017, there was a sign in the sky heralding the things shortly to come to pass. This sign occurred in the heavens during the Jewish Feast of the Trumpets, which has long been associated with the heralding upcoming important events to the Jewish people. It is exactly how the stars had aligned in the heavens as John revealed in Revelation 12, 1 and 2. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars, and she, being with child, cried, travailing in birth, in pain to be delivered. This heavenly sign demonstrates that the Messiah is watching over Israel. The same sign also appeared on September 22, 1827, when Joseph Smith received the plates from the angel Moroni. Since the interpretation of this sign is that the woman gives birth to the kingdom of God, how appropriate it was that it was given as a sign when Joseph Smith was about to translate the Book of Mormon. Three and a half years from that date, on April 6, 1830, the church was organized. Since this represents the birth of God's ecclesiastical kingdom, could the appearance in the heavens in 2017 then represent that shortly God's governmental kingdom will be heralded in? If you remember from your readings in Come Follow Me back in 2019, we understand that chapter 12 of Revelation deals with the events that took place in our pre-mortal existence as being a type for things yet to come as well. It dealt with the war in heaven and Satan being the star that fell with one third of our brothers and sisters who are at war with those who followed Christ. Just as Isaiah prophesied in Layers, where the things fulfilled in the past are types of things to be repeated and fulfilled in the future, John too followed that same pattern. This is one example. 
These verses represent the pre-existence where Lucifer fell, as did one-third of the souls who fell and followed him. And again, it represents the first century AD, where the woman was driven into the wilderness of apostasy and the kingdom of God, represented by the sun, was devoured by the dragon or Satan shortly after it began due to the persecutions and deaths of the apostles. Again, Lucifer consumed precious souls, causing them to lose their heavenly rewards by their choices in deciding to follow the enticements of Satan. Well, this verse and this sign signify what is happening in our day as well. There's currently a separation going on between the righteous and the wicked. Sadly, many souls today are deciding to follow Satan or are being caught in his snares and can't find their way out. It appears that Lucifer is winning. This time, however, Christ is going to triumph and the woman will tread over the dragon with her feet. I'd like to point out another type. In the Book of Mormon, after the signs of Christ's birth and of his crucifixion occurred, Satan was able to harden the hearts of the people by downplaying those signs that Samuel the Lamanite had spoken about. Thus, people would not believe them to be signs from God. And in spite of this, there were still many who believed, and they turned their lives around even though they were half a world away from where the Messiah had ministered. It's amazing to see how the same phenomenon is still playing out in our day. The signs are before us, and yet people just don't accept them as such. Now, let me explain this unusual heavenly presentation. Virgo, which is represented by the woman, is the only female constellation in the zodiac. So she's the only woman that Revelation could refer to in fulfilling this heavenly sign. She has been long associated with Israel as well. So here, a star and a planet were aligned to create the brightest star, representing the sun at her shoulder. Jupiter came forth from her womb on this date. The sign occurred the very day after the Jewish Feast of the Trumpets, also known as Rosh Hashanah, which has long been associated with heralding in the time of troubles for Jewish people. Rosh Hashanah is the Jewish New Year celebration, and this heavenly sign heralds the fact that the world has been put on notice. Jupiter passed through the woman beginning in November of 2016, and it remained inside her for 42 weeks. Being in retrograde formation, it appeared stationary to us. Of course, 38 to 42 weeks are also typical gestation periods for a baby. The sun left between her legs just as a baby would come out of its mother's womb, and as the Jews would bring in another year. Birth pains are often used symbolically in the scripture related to the last days because things are difficult to begin with. And as a woman gets closer to the time of birth, the pain increases and the contractions, or in this case, God's judgments become more intense and closer and closer together until you can't distinguish between when one pain begins and the other one ends. Finally, birth comes and a miracle is born. Travail is replaced with joy and peace. Now, some of the scriptures that use this analogy are found in Micah 5.3, Isaiah 26, 117 and 118, 1 Thessalonians 5.3, and Revelation 12 and 5. Here, you'll see that the moon was positioned at the feet of Virgo, just as the scripture indicated. The crown on her head represents not only the nine stars in the Leo constellation, but above her head, you'll also see Mercury, Mars, and Venus, which indicate the 12 stars above her head. And according to churchofjesuschrist.org, we know what a lot of the symbolism represents. The woman represents the church. Her man-child coming forth out of the womb represents the kingdom of God. And the great red dragon with seven heads found in verse 3 represents Satan and his followers who execute evil with perfect execution. 
John saw the twelve stars, which we know represents the twelve apostles who, who preside over the church under Jesus Christ's direction. John showed us the continuation of the war in heaven. He not only saw Satan's persistence at warring against the church of Jesus Christ in the meridian of time, but also his ongoing campaigns to war against the restored gospel and all else who keep the commandments of God. This will continue and his efforts will strengthen until Christ's coming. Now at the same time, as long as the saints remain faithful, their spiritual blessings will increase and their light and conviction will grow more powerful as well. Bruce R. McConkie of the Quorum of the Twelve, who passed away in 1985, offered more insight to the symbolism of the woman described in Revelation 12, 1 and 2. He wrote, as the moon shines by reflected light, so do all earthly churches and kingdoms. They are under, beneath, and lower than the true church. The highest eternal reward they can offer is the terrestrial kingdom, whose glory is like that of the moon. Now, you might wonder how the church could give birth to the kingdom of God, since we often use the church of Jesus Christ and the kingdom of God interchangeably. Let me try and explain. What has been restored so far is the ecclesiastical portion of God's kingdom. That's existed since the first vision in 1820 and has continued ever since. The repeat of that sign in 2017 shows that the church will shortly give birth to include the governmental portion of the kingdom of God, which also like the church portion of God's kingdom will last throughout the millennium. Now, just as the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints has begun slowly with only six members on April 6, 1830, the political kingdom of God could also be equally as imperceptible to the world. It won't even be until the council at Adam on Diamond when the reins are officially being given over to Christ, and that is likely to be a few years off yet. Now, the third warning sign, the dragon referred to in Revelation 12, 3, and 4. And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and seven crowns upon his head, and his tail grew the third part of the stars from heaven, and did cast them to earth. Of course, this is a reference to the one-third of the hosts of heaven that followed Satan in our pre-earth life. Yet, as this sign is given, I believe that it's also a type of things on earth now, where one-third of the hosts of those who had been following Christ have fallen from those once sure testimonies due to the deceptions of Satan and his major influence on our society. I'll get into this in greater detail on my next video. Also, Draco is the Latin word for dragon or serpent, which also are both symbols representing Lucifer. Annually, a meteor shower breaks out around Draco as Earth collides with bits of debris shed by the dust vapor trail of a periodic comet known as the 21P Giacobani Zinner Comet. This collision with the Earth's atmosphere causes the flashes of light in the shooting stars to illuminate the skies. Thus, it's called the Draconoid Meteor Shower. Well, in 2017, this meteor shower took place during the Feast of Tabernacles, or Sukkot, which in Hebrew means huts or booths. This is another full week of Jewish holy days in remembrance of the 40-year exodus when they lived in huts and even used a tent for their tabernacle before entering into the Holy Land. The Sukkot also coincided with the shower last year, peaking on October 7th and 8th, so that these signs in heavens fit the criteria as well. Now, to better explain this sign, I should also clarify that there are seven stars of the Corona Borealis constellation. Corona is a Latin word which means crown. So that would obviously represent the seven crowns. The seven stars in the Ursa Minor constellation could represent the seven heads of this dragon 
and the ten kings would be taken from the other ten closest stars to the dragon, representing different kings with ties and allegiances to different ideologies, being representative of the different constellations surrounding it. Now, the number of these all add up to 24, and of course, 24 is symbolic of the priesthood. So just as there is priesthood authority given through Christ, there is a counterfeit priesthood authority given through Satan to his legions representing Babylon, which is John's reference or word to what is called the great and abominable church described in the Book of Mormon. So, in 2017, we have the first three heavenly signs given of impending judgments and foreshadowing the events shortly to come, along with the need to hasten our efforts in preparation for Christ's earthly kingdom. So, Let's move on to the three signs of 2020. On June 21st, 2020, there was another darkening of the sun, or an annular eclipse representing the current state of man on earth as described in Revelation 8.12. There was complete darkness in places like Saudi Arabia, Pakistan, and India, but it presented itself differently in Israel. In Israel, one-third of the sun, one-third of the moon, and one-third of the stars had fallen from the sky on another feast day, which was the summer solstice. This is in fulfillment of John's prophecy of the fourth angel sounding his trump. I'll cover this in greater detail in my next video segment. But for now, let's just suffice it to say that as many talk about the seven year period of tribulation symbolizing completion or complete, we are on track with each warning sign. Where did the idea of the seven years come from? Well, it came from the prophecies of Daniel, where he recorded a week or a seven-year period that marks the time of the seven years, wherein at one point the abomination of desolation will take place. This time of intense judgment is also signaled by John the Revelator, who spoke of seven angels sounding the seven trumps as recorded in Revelation chapters 8 through 10. John didn't affix a time around these judgments, other than stating that they would sound before the second coming of the Savior after the opening of the seventh seal. It's also a given that this time the world won't repent as a whole. Therefore, the judgments of God can't be stayed. Then, on December 14th, 2020, there was another eclipse that crossed over Chile and Argentina, marking the exact middle date of the two North American eclipses. Now, this happened over Hanukkah to qualify as a warning sign as well. And there are 2,422 days between eclipses, which is 6.6 .6 years, and the exact midpoint is marked by this eclipse. This seemed a little too well orchestrated to be a coincidence, so I mention that here. It is a sign to those residing in South America, which is also part of New Jerusalem, to watch for the judgments, which will shortly befall the world if the inhabitants don't repent. Now, the question is, how long do we wait before God's judgments completely fall upon us? We'll find some clues from Daniel and from Revelation, which I'll cover in just a moment. Then, on December 21st, 2020, there was another sign manifested that reminded us to look heavenward. There appeared the Christmas star that coincided perfectly with the end of the one half hour of silence. So if you take the date of when the Palmyra temple was dedicated, then we have confirmation that the one half hour of silence or 20.88 years ended at that point. For me as a believer, this is confirmation that the heavens are corroborating that we are in perfect sync with the Lord's prophets of old. In review, it appears that the year 2020 without a doubt marked a year of great tribulation for the entire world, not with just COVID-19, but also with thunderings and lightnings, flooding, fires, and earthquakes, all fulfilling several scriptures talking of our day. As part of the signs that have been given, I am now going to cover some of the signs from the perspective of Daniel, who was bold enough to offer some clues to extrapolate possible dates of some apocalyptic events. And after researching the time frames, 
everything points to things beginning to happen at an accelerated rate now. However, I am only offering the following as a possible time frame with the following explanation. About a year and a half ago, I did a video that I was really excited about because I had just started to really delve into the prophecies of the last days and had begun to truly understand the metaphors being used by Daniel and John the Revelator. I was in the beginning stages of comparing and contrasting various scriptures together to try to come up with a reasonable timeline as to where we stood at that point. Before I started my studies, I felt that the second coming would probably be several years away. One reason why I felt that way was that it seemed to me that everyone in every time period since the original apostles has always thought that it could happen in their lifetime. Well, when I was about 14, I remember talking to an older couple who exemplified solid members of the church. I had been home teaching them, and they had felt then, some 46 years ago, that the second coming was just around the corner, and they felt that they might still be around to see it. Now, looking back, I realized that they believed this due to some circular thinking, of which every human being living on this planet is guilty of from time to time on several subjects, similar to what you see in this chart. They, too, just accepted that it could be in their lifetime. They passed away long before the turn of this century, and certainly before the Second Coming. Now, I know I'm going out on a limb because Daniel's timeline is so specific. My supposition is that Daniel truly saw our day, and we are those whom he spoke about. Yet, because I recognize that I'm not a prophet, and I am fallible in my thinking, I asked Heavenly Father, what if I'm wrong in the way that I'm interpreting these signs? Would I shake the testimonies of those weaker in faith if I were mistaken? And I want you to know that I made this a matter of daily prayer for more than a year, period, as I continue to study the scriptures on the subject. I studied the words of the prophets from our canonized scriptures and from modern apostles and prophets as well. I can't count the number of times that I asked for guidance. Where I was directed to look at a particular place in the scriptures, I looked up word definitions for deeper meaning. I did all of this because I knew I was going to create this video series and wanted to be as accurate and detailed as possible. Thus, I researched the last days and the second coming of Christ with trepidation, asking the Lord to modify any false belief that I have been hanging on to due to tradition. I questioned everything I heard before in Gospel Doctrine class, Elders Quorum, and High Priest Group Instruction. And so I'm now sharing a glimpse of what I received in response to my questions and prayers. And I pass my findings along, not so that you'll blindly accept what I've discovered, but so that you might do something similar. I believe that if you do, you'll also reach similar conclusions. So I pray to know what I might share. And the following scripture in Matthew 24 came into my mind. But of that day and hour of Christ's second coming, knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. And so I thought, well, exactly. So doesn't this seem like I'm narrowing down the Lord's timeline more closely than what I should? Maybe I just need to let this go and allow others to form their own opinions. Then the words in Daniel 12 came into my mind, that the wise shall know the time of these things. Well, being the person that I am, I replied, well, what if I'm a fool then and not counted amongst the wise? I thought back to a few people's comments alluding to this as I've read them on YouTube. Then the following idea came to my mind. You are studying and praying in faith to gain greater light and knowledge as I directed. You are trying to follow Jesus Christ and to recognize the signs as they come. As long as you are reporting what you are seeing and recognize that they complement the scriptures and don't contradict them, and your aim is to bring people closer to Christ, then even if these things aren't the final time these events are going to happen, they are at least a type, and you won't have misled anyone. Wouldn't it be wiser to share and to help others to prepare as well? And even if these things that I gave Daniel come and go and the dates you've calculated differ, then you'll know that the second coming will still occur in Heavenly Father's own due time. And there will be similar events 
that would yet occur when the righteous of the world are better primed for Christ's second coming. So in the meantime, you are becoming more prepared to meet the Lord when he does come, and you can better help strengthen others as well. So, after receiving that impression, I felt that it would be smart to let others in on the following findings as well. And even if others might consider me to be more of a wise guy than a wise man, to me, it only matters what the Lord thinks of me. Now, let's go to the Doctrine and Covenants, section 45, for another perspective of our time period in which we live. Here it's talking about the times of the Gentiles about to be fulfilled sometime after the light of the gospel breaks forth and after most don't perceive the light and therefore turn their hearts from Christ due to the precepts of men. Then in verse 30 it says, And in that generation shall the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled, and there shall be men standing in that generation that shall not pass away, until they see an overflowing scourge, for a desolating sickness shall cover the land. This is followed with earthquakes in diverse places and many desolations, or various things causing despair and destruction. Now, in verse 38, it finally says, Even so it shall be in the day when they shall see these things, then shall they know that the hour is nigh. And it shall come to pass, that he that feareth me shall be looking forth for the great day of the Lord to come, even for signs of the coming of the Son of Man. They shall see signs and wonders, for they shall be shown forth in the heavens above and in the earth beneath. If we don't recognize these verses as describing our day, then we're probably not very in tune to now recognize that which God is showing us. Now here, it's talking about the overflowing or overspreading scourge as well. When the disciple in Christ's day heard of this, they were troubled. In Christ's response to this, in verse 35, he said, Be not troubled, for when all these things shall come to pass, ye may know that the promises which have been made unto you shall be fulfilled. What are these promises that were made? Well, they are the assurances that God hasn't forgotten his covenants with Israel, and that the time of the Jews will shortly come in. I should also note that President Nelson declared this of us as well. He said, We are also children of the covenant. We have received, as did they of old, the holy priesthood and the everlasting gospel. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are our ancestors. We are of Israel. We have a right to receive the gospel, blessings of the priesthood, and eternal life. Nations of the earth will be blessed by our efforts and by the labors of our posterity. The literal seed of Abraham and those who are gathered into his family by adoption receive these promised blessings predicated upon acceptance of the Lord and obedience to his commandments. This begins when the Lord comes to the Mount of Olives and the entire nation recognizes that Jesus is their Messiah at once. And as they in turn bring the gospel of their Jehovah to the heathen nations, those very countries whose design of committing another abomination of desolation wipe out the Jewish nation of Israel is thwarted. Daniel prophesied regarding to the timing of these tribulations in chapter 12, as he saw our day. Now, after seeing the destruction prior to the Lord's second coming, he really wanted to know when these things would happen. And so he prayed for this knowledge. And this is what the Lord gave him in reply. In Daniel 12, 8 through 13, it reads, And I heard, but I understood not. Then said I, O oh my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? And he said, Go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed until the time of the end. Many shall be purified and made white and be tried, but the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. What do these verses mean? First, let me read the synopsis as given in the Gospel Library for Daniel 12. To put these verses into context, it says, quote, 
In the last days, Michael will deliver Israel from their troubles. Daniel tells of the two resurrections. The wise will know the times and the meanings of his visions, unquote. As mentioned, Daniel is wondering about the timing of the winding up scenes and desolations of the last days just prior to the second coming. Well, basically, he's told not to worry because the timing won't be revealed until the time of the end. But then he talks about that time and sees that there will be many who will be purified and made white despite the blood and sins of that generation, which is referring to our generation living on earth now. And remember, both Elder Rasband and President Nelson have confirmed that we are living at that time now. How are we purified and made white? Well, it's done through the sacred ordinances of baptism, partaking of the sacrament, and by receiving the temple ordinances and are living up to those covenants and providing those ordinances for those who have passed on. Of important note to us, the wise shall understand the exact timing of these things. So this is a promise to each of us if we are considered wise in Heavenly Father's eyes. Verse 11. And from that time that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away, and the abomination that make a desolate set up, there shall be a thousand two hundred and ninety days. So, what is this referring to? The daily sacrifice, of course, refers to the temple ordinances. He's talking about the day that the daily sacrifice is taken away. And remember, in chapter 9, Daniel even referred to the cause of the closure due to an abomination event, which could possibly be the coronavirus. What day were all the temples closed and the daily sacrifice was taken away? Well, that happened on March 25th, 2020. And what marks the 1,290 days after that? 1,290 days after March 25th is three and a half years later, which brings us to October 6th, 2023. This date certainly sounds like the time given for one of the woes that John the Revelator referred to because it's coming towards the end of the tribulation period. So if I were to surmise, I would say that this could be the woe of the sixth angel where the war would take place that would lead up to one third of the earth's inhabitants being destroyed as John the Revelator mentioned. This would fit the criteria of the abomination that maketh desolate. Blessed is he that waiteth and cometh to the thousand three hundred and five and thirty days. Well, this is just an additional 45 days after October 6, which brings us to November 20th, 2023. Again, blessed are those that make it to the 1335 days after the closing of the temples which would be November 20th, 2023. Could it be that blessed is he that waiteth until that date is talking about the date of the great council that Daniel prophesied about, where the Ancient of Days will be able to turn the keys over to the Savior? Or could it just be the time span given for that war to last? I'm not sure, but let's continue. But go thou thy way, till the end be, for thou shalt rest and stand in thy lot at the end of days. This promise shall come to all. The obedient who persevere through the tribulation of this time period will receive their lot to be able to stand to greet the Savior at the end of days before the world transforms back into its terrestrial state. Those unrepentant who survive that war will receive their lot of being burned at the Lord's final coming which is the abomination that will leave the desolate. Wow. Let's look at this graphically. The two previous events where Jerusalem was seized upon and left desolate happened millennia ago. The first was in Daniel's day. It's during this first Jewish captivity that we got the story of Daniel in the lion's den. The second huge abomination for the Jews that left Jerusalem desolate took place in 70 AD when it was destroyed and left desolate by the Romans. The last time will be during the Great Tribulation leading up to the Second Coming, 
At this point, Israel itself won't be destroyed because the Savior will rescue them, so the abomination of desolation will more likely occur in the region. But because of the two witnesses, it won't occur in Jerusalem. However, during this week of tribulation that Daniel spoke about, which I believe this abomination of desolation crescendos up to the same event that John spoke about when he prophesied of the two woes when the fifth and the sixth angels sound their trumps. More specifically, when the sixth angel sounds his trump is what Daniel is speaking about with regards to the abomination that will leave desolate. Nowhere else in the scriptures is there an exact time frame given as when to expect things to happen. Yet Daniel foretold a timeline starting when the daily sacrifices end. So, if the temple's closing on 325 is the correct starting point for this final countdown, and at this point in history, based on other sides coinciding, it seems possible, then according to Daniel, the long prophesied abomination of desolation will take place at the beginning part of October 2023. You need to look no further than Daniel's interpretation of King Nebuchadnezzar's dream to find confirmation that the timing of Daniel's prophecies are an accurate indication for the timing of major world religious events. We know that the first part of this prophecy was fulfilled in 1820 when he spoke about when the kingdom of God would be cut out of the mountain without hands. We can see that its fulfillment could only occur during a narrow window of time. It would have to be aligned with both world history and the description of his prophecy. Let's read as Daniel talks about the kingdom of God. He speaks of ten toes, part of clay and part of iron, representing the ten kingdoms who mingle themselves with the seed of men. These ten toes represent the ten ruling powers of the 19th century. These ruling monarchs weren't necessarily the same ethnicity or religion of the subjects over whom they had sovereignty. For example, the British Empire held sovereignty over India and Canada and most of Africa during the time that the gospel of Jesus Christ was restored. So in verse 44, it says, And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. For as much as thou sawest that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it break in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God hath made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter, and the dream is certain, and the interpretation thereof sure. So according to this prophecy, God will set up a kingdom the kingdom of God, sometime after the fall of the Roman Empire. And it would have to happen in a time when there existed ten kingdoms representing the ten toes that can be traced back to the Roman Empire. Now, without hands means that it would be set up under the divine intervention of Christ because it's not going to be set up by man. In Hebrew, rock, stone, and cornerstone all frequently refer to the Savior. So it is a fitting metaphor that Christ's kingdom, representing the stone that will fill the entire earth and it will consume all those earthly kingdoms to stand forever, is talking about Christ's kingdom. This is the Roman Empire at its zenith. So what we need to do is review the countries that obtained their own sovereignty from what was once part of the great Roman Empire, or who had held sovereignty over what was once part of the Roman Empire. We need to find that point in history when there were only 10 kingdoms coming out of this geographical area. Now we know from Nebuchadnezzar's dream that in the day of the 10 kingdoms, God would set up his kingdom on earth that would never again be divided, but would break all other kingdoms into pieces. So directly after the fall of the Roman Empire, several small countries obtained their autonomy. I believe there were somewhere in between 17 and 18 when this happened. 
Now, centuries passed after that, and there was never a time when there were only ten kingdoms that came out of what was once the Roman Empire. That is, until the imperialistic 19th century, when the world was divided into 11 empires, 10 of which either had roots from, or at that point had sovereignty over, a territory that once belonged to the Romans. Before my mission, I read A Marvelous Work in Wonder by Legrand Richards. In speaking about the kingdom of God, he referenced that it would make an interesting study to see how the timing of the restoration was fulfilled. I thought, what? Is that all you're going to say about it? Well, after my mission, I went to the local college library, fully expecting to discover what I was looking for, and I'm happy to report that I did. There, I uncovered a historical atlas of the world by R. R. Palmer, published by Rand McNally back in 1976. It was a much newer atlas then. Now, R. R., or Robert Palmer, was a distinguished American historian who taught at Princeton and Yale universities. He wasn't a member of the church, but he specialized in European and American history from the 18th and 19th centuries with an emphasis of French history. It pleasantly surprised me to learn that in 1830, the world could be broken down into just 11 kingdoms. The only one that geographically could not be traced back to the original Roman Empire was Russia. Every other sovereignty that ruled could either be traced back to the Roman Empire, or at that time had held sovereignty over what was once part of the Roman Empire. For example, the Danish Empire, or Denmark, wasn't originally part of the Roman Empire. But in the 19th century, a portion of what was once in the Roman Empire was ruled over by Denmark. And that's what allows the Danish to be counted as one of the Ten Kingdoms. The other nine were actually geographically part of the Roman Empire at one time. So as I researched this further, between 1820 to 1830, when Joseph Smith received his vision, received the plates from Moroni, published the Book of Mormon, and officially registered Christ's restored church as a new religion in the United States, these events coincided within the days of those kings. After a little over 2,400 years, the time finally came when the kingdom of God could be established in order to fulfill this prophecy. Again, it was the only time there were only 10 kingdoms of sovereignty in what was once the Roman Empire. How cool is that? This matched the symbolism of King Nebuchadnezzar's dream perfectly. And so there is no doubt in my mind that chapters 8 through 12 will equally play out as prophesied. What have we learned? Well, first, heavenly signs are ways that the Lord has always communicated with his children. And two, they usually coincide with Jewish holy days. Three, they both warn the wicked and give strength to the righteous, knowing that this world is in his hands. And four, they are not rare occurrences. As God speaks through signs and wonders as well, we should be listening and looking toward the heavens to know the approximate timing of what is about to happen. What else have we learned? Well, Daniel's prophecies harmonize with the timeline spoken of by John the Revelator. And those match the three heavenly signs given back in 2017 up through the present, all indicating the tribulation period that we are now in. The midpoint of the time of tribulation matches the timing of the end of the half hour of silence. And we also learned that the abomination of desolation is to take place near the end of the seven year period that Daniel prophesied. And thus, we must be spiritually and temporally prepared to weather the storm. I hope you'll study these signs yourself and gain your own witness about the Lord's timing to understand we are living in fulfillment of prophecy. As I spoke of Daniel's prophecies, many have thought that this is pure speculation. After all, no one could possibly know the timing. Well, it is true that I'm interpreting Daniel's revelation 
bearing in mind that I made correlations as to what he spoke about and what we are experiencing today. These are confirmable events that I'm sharing. However, in doing my research, it's a true miracle to me that I've been able to make some of these connections. There were many times I felt directed to research in a new direction only to find the missing piece of the puzzle in the exact issue that, that I prayerfully felt inspired to investigate. And no, these conclusions didn't come to me all at once. And so I knew that I had to research and pray more for greater inspiration in order to gain more light on the subject. Thus, linking correlations between events came often, one edit at a time. As far as the signs that I've shared go, I can only express that I've felt intelligence and light as I've prayerfully studied these things. I sincerely pray that this presentation encourages you to prayerfully study for yourself and see how close we are to the winding up scenes that all the prophets have alluded to since Adam. May each of us be children of light so that the Lord's coming won't take us as a thief in the night. This is my prayer. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, amen. This concludes part three of Fasten Your Seatbelts for the Second Coming video series. In part four, we'll cover the four angels who've already sounded their trumps after the opening of the seventh seal.